We support gaming communities, DeFi communities, all different types of communities. So now collab land or token gating, which now is everywhere. Everyone knows token gating, but we are the creators of token gating. Now we have over 50,000 communities that use us. Anyone who wants to create a community uses collab land. Most of the brands that you see that are involved in the crypto space are using Collabland. Adidas, Puma, Lacoste, Prada, Gucci, Porsche, all the brands are. And the really cool part about brands is what they're doing is they're activating people into crypto. You have just heard from Anjali Young, co-founder of Collabland, an automated member management system for tokenized communities. Anjali has a 30 plus year history with online communities as a creator, member, and in leadership. She has also worked as a lawyer, adjunct professor, and early tech startup employee. In addition to her interest in community and Web3 onboarding, she has a passion for NFTs and the artists who create them. Anjali is one of only a handful of Web3 leaders to have received recognition from Salesforce, and is listed as one of its Web3 advisory board members. So let us dive right in. All right, here we're from WebEx Asia, recording live from the conference. And welcome, Anjali, from Colorblend. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We get you at the end of the day after two panels and you're still buzzing with energy. Yeah, oh my gosh. I love what I do. I love talking about what I do. The work is very much um, on Zoom calls every day and working from home. Our team is entirely distributed. So for me, being out with people, I get a lot of energy and I love that I get to talk about it socially, really, instead of the day to day of you know the tasks that I have to complete every day. Being able to take a step back and have a global view on it and be able to talk about the trends that I'm seeing or the different learnings from the last three years. It's just a lot of fun and I get very excited. Where do you want to start unpacking that? Oh boy, we can start with, yeah, the last three years. What's it been like from day one and how we got started and how we got here? How about Please. that? All right, wonderful. So in we started the company Abridged in 2018. So this is five years old. We pivoted. Originally, we had a social contract wallet. We pivoted away from that and we moved to no-code tooling. And then Collabland was a reference implementation of our no-code tooling. So it was a way to say, look, here's this thing that we've made. It was actually for a hackathon, Hack Money 2020. Uh, it was a hackathon project using our no-code tools, an experiment just to say, oh, look, here's something you can build with our no-code tooling. Developers, listen up. You can all build something fun using our no-code tooling. What happened from that was unexpected, which is everyone was saying, oh, this thing, yes, this thing we need. Thank you for making it. We'll just take that. Thank you very much. Forget about the no-code tooling. This is what we want. And so that's where Collabland started. It started as a DAO tool, which is if you have shares of a DAO, then you can join a group together. This is your DAO now. And then you can talk about the voting and talk about who should get what grant. Yes, yeah, so it was really a DAO tool initially. And then social tokens started using us, investment groups started using us, NFT communities started using us. And then now we support gaming communities, DeFi communities, all different types of communities. So now collab land or token gating, which now is everywhere. Everyone knows token gating, but we are the creators of token gating. It was not something that was obvious at that time. It was definitely an experiment, a crypto experiment. So now, yeah, we have over 50,000 communities that use us within all different types of crypto, but anyone who wants to create a community uses Collabland. For those people who don't know what token gating is, yeah. let's define it briefly. Okay, so token gating is access based on what you hold in your wallet. So you, Norbert, I have a token, Anjali token, made up, and I've distributed it to 1,000 people. And then now I want those 1,000 people to join my group. I want to make sure that they're holders of the Anjali token. So when Norbert joins my community, Collabland, you'll log in with Collabland, and Collabland will say, oh, let me check Norbert's wallet. Does Norbert's wallet include the Anjali token? If yes, you can join the community. And then we do constant balance checks. We have an event listener, so we check to see if anything has changed within your wallet. And if there's any event where the token is removed, or maybe now you have 10 tokens or 5 tokens, then the 
access can change. Either it'll remove access or gain access based on the activity within your wallet. So that's token gating, which is now for anything, everything. If you want to buy a special merchandise, then you have to have a specific token in order to. Or if you want to go to a specific event, then you have to have a specific token. So it's really giving a utility and giving a use case for tokens. When I looked at Collabland and was thinking about network effects, every community has its own network effects and needs to build it up. Do you actually get a network effect across the community? Oh my gosh, for sure. Like, we've never done any marketing at all. It's all organic growth. And how do you get organic growth? Well, a member of one community sees Collabland, and then if there's a new community that's starting that doesn't have token gating, they'll say, hey, use Collabland. And if they've already connected with Collabland in one community, then they don't have to connect their wallet again. It allows them to remain within the circle and remain safe within the circle. So that's really the network effects of Collabland. We have plans moving forward that we can talk about later, but specifically right now, the network's effects are the communities that use us and then the members within the communities. Also admins, community admins and moderating teams. If they're used to using your tools, they're being hired for other projects. It's its own cottage industry, being an admin or a moderator. One admin or moderator may be an admin or moderator to 10 different communities. And so they're gonna take the tools with them that they're using. So in a lot of different ways, it's really been the network effects that have allowed Collabland to grow. Maybe I need to upgrade my community. I'm still on meetup.com. <laughs> and it seems like there are new registration systems. All the side events here at the conference are on Luma. Right. And Luma didn't exist a few months ago. Then it came up and now everybody seems to be using it. Exactly. And Same so idea though, really, when you think about Luma, it's like, why is everyone using Luma? One crypto event starts using Luma. I go to that crypto event, now either I'm hosting my own event or I hear about someone else hosting it, I'm like, use Luma. So it's like these conferences and the little events that happen around conferences, I'm sure that's a huge part of Luma's growth as well. You're taking a very community-driven approach or the community-focused approach to it. One would assume that across all the communities that you have, there's quite a bit of intelligence that you can gather from that just in terms of which topics are hot, where people have NFTs, etc. A lot of data, really. We see it first. Which types of tokens people are using to gate on. Within NFT communities, open editions became very popular. And so we saw ERC-1155 taking off, overtaking even ERC-721. When social tokens were taking off, ERC-20 is taking off. You can see in the data how people are creating communities. That's one part of it. And also what chains. We support 25 different blockchains. The chains and the communities that are growing on different chains change week to week. And so you can really see who's pushing on trying to bring creators on. Like Arbitrum was in third place two weeks ago and I was like, oh, it hasn't been in the top five in the last three months. So what are they doing at Arbitrum now? And then you can see, oh, that's what they're doing. They're marketing more toward creators. They're marketing toward people that are doing meme tokens. You can see what chains are doing. And then also the ones that support Collabland. We just had Nier coming on. So when they ask us, oh, we want to bring Collabland onto our chain, then we're like, okay, they're making a concerted effort now to get creators to come into their space or get NFT artists to come into their space. You definitely get to see what's happening. As far as how we're sharing that data right now, we are not. But we we are going to be starting to provide global analytics because like you said, this is important and this data is important and for the market to see who's invested in this type of work, where's this growth coming from? And really with communities, it's bottom up growth. It's not the people at the top deciding we're going to create all these communities on Arbitrum. It's not. It's projects that are minting on Arbitrum that now are taking a community focus. So you really get to see where the people are. In this space, it's very difficult to know who's who and what's doing what, especially with all the bots. There's so many bots, you just don't know what's what. But starting a community, having people connecting their wallet and joining a community, that's real. You don't have bots buying an NFT and then signing up with Collabland and joining a community. That's not happening. It's really interesting. We are going to be starting to share that global analytics. Maybe talk a bit how you, on the origins, 
funded collar blend because yeah. I think that's a pretty interesting story as well. Yeah, and we're definitely going through a transition right now, but initially we have a seed investment and that was starting in December of 2020. So really before any of this happened, our seed investors were def- definitely interested in the vision of what this could be. And then over the last few years, we've funded through blockchains and wallet integrations, not charging at the community level. But when a new blockchain wants to come on Flow, Solana, Tezos, Near, XRPL, whoever, they would approach us and say, we need to bring something like this to our chain. Can we have that? And we'd say yes, and we need a grant. It was all funded through grants from the Blockchain Foundation. And then we support 25 different wallets. And so when wallets come to us, they want communities to use their wallet Where do they get users from? If they look through the list of what wallets Collabland supports and they don't find their wallet, then how are they going to get people to use their wallet? Really, so it's an opportunity. If you provide a service, then they're going to be able to get users for their products. And that's how we funded it. When we first started out, it was give everything away for free. Give it away for free. You're going to be able to have the wallet and the blockchain integrations, and that's going to be able to support the work. But over the last three years now, communities grow. Our services grow. People want more and more functionality from Collabland. That continues to grow. And so there will be a, you know, a freemium model, which is there's a free model and then there's going to be a paid model. We are going to be moving into that and bear market things. That's just the reality. Staying free for a company that does not monetize user data is a challenge. Because all of the other free products out there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, they monetize user data, like what we talked about a little bit earlier, which is that mapping from wallet address to their social ID, and then what's in that wallet, and how that information in that wallet, what transactions are happening in that wallet. That's all very rich and valuable data, and people want it. We do not want to share that. We believe that data belongs to the member themselves. And we want to try to create a model moving forward where you can provide a service and you understand that you're going to have to pay if you want to be able to hold on to your own data. Will that work or will that not work? I believe it will in crypto, especially. I think we have an opportunity here because there's so much emphasis on individual ownership, not only ownership of your digital assets, but ownership of who you are on the Internet of what you do on the internet. And if you own it, that means no one is gonna sell it from under you, which means you should be able to monetize it when and if you want to, but that also means you have to provide some kind of consideration for the services that you're getting. That's where we're moving and we're hoping people will understand that. That's my gripes with the NFT space. You'd also talked about 25 wallets and you can walk the floor down here at the exhibition hall. Many booths offer you an NFT, but then you need to have a specific wallet to take it in. I don't want 10 wallets on my mobile phone. That's a flip side of decentralization at this point. At some point, there will probably be a valid aggregator also that brings it together. Yeah, the- there will be something. There's already services like that. Delegate Cash, for example, where you can connect multiple wallets and you only have to have one signer wallet and then you can have all the wallets that are connected to that. That's going to keep going. I don't think there's going to be one wallet to win it all. I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be one chain to win it all. I think there's going to be different purposes for different wallets. There's going to be different purposes for different chains. I mean, with wallets, it's really interesting, too, because your wallet is your identity in a lot of ways. When you're logging in somewhere, you can see what assets you have. Maybe you can see what verifiable credentials you have. You'll see what POAPs you have, what events that you've been to. You may want to keep that separate, just like you may want to have different social profiles. My LinkedIn profile is very different from my Instagram profile. It just is. And so with wallets, you're going to want to have, I may not want to share everything with you, Norbert. I may not. And so there is going to be a use case for having different wallets, but there's also going to be a use case for having an aggregate identity and maybe multiple aggregate identities. And when you think about that, we're not all one person. The social media right now, they expect us all to be one person. On Facebook, that's who you are. That's supposed to be all of you. You're not allowed to have multiple identities on Facebook. But really, you're a different person. Right now, you're a podcaster to me. I know you in that capacity. At your work, you have a different personality and you're sharing different things. At home with your spouse, you have a different personality. Like, we are also fractured. 
And in that way, I think having more online identity and what we do online it is giving us that opportunity. And even NFTs give us that opportunity because you can have one NFT for one platform and another NFT on another platform and they can both be you, but they bring out different parts of you. And you might be an anon in another community and there's value in being an anon as well because you're allowed to speak up more you're allowed to criticize more there's an opportunity for you to say the things that maybe you couldn't say if everyone knew exactly where you worked and what your name was and how old you are what country you're from so i think a lot of different things are going to open up for us i don't think digital identity is going to be one thing our identities as a whole, are going to be able to be split up into what we want to show to different people. And anyway, that was a wallet question, but it all comes around for me. If you talk about these use cases, let's talk about Japan, the language. How does Collabland do here in Japan? You came all the way over here to speak about your project, so you do have a user base here? Absolutely. We just did a profile of all top 100 communities, and there are a lot of communities that are from Japan, like Crypto Ninjas is a big one that's here. It's a gaming community. So there are a lot of Asian, I will say not just Japan, but Korea, China, mm -hmm. Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam. We have a lot of users and members of crypto communities in Asia. And why is that? I don't know because I'm not from this area, but my guess is from what I'm hearing, there is a lot of interest in the social aspect of crypto in this space. I know DeFi, of course, is very popular, but I almost feel like Asia is more forward with WeChat. There is this interesting movement toward socializing crypto as well. And I think that's the reason they're using Collabland. So for me, this is my first time coming to Japan, first time really traveling in Asia. And so it's very exciting to be here and to try to meet other people that are also in the space. And I haven't had a chance to go down to the exhibition hall yet, but everyone I've met so far, they know Collabland. So they've heard of Collabland and it's very exciting to see because they have bought an NFT or purchased some sort of token and joined a community and verified with Collabland. And, you know, that's part of just the fact that we've been doing this for three years. And so if they've been around and doing it, then they've heard of us. But yeah, that's really the reason is that we see so much interest from Asian cultures into this social crypto. At a time now where in US there's regulation and people are turning, they're not really seeing it. They're mostly focused on the NFT and the speculation around the NFT. When on the Asian side, they see the NFT as a membership token and an entry into a community. And they want to be in a community. They want to be with other people. So I'm excited to learn more about that. And that's my investment to be here and, and to speak here. Wonderful. If you look at the US, so in one respect, if I look at brands and I look at Nike, seems to be across all global players, maybe the ones who have gotten NFTs the best. And maybe it's a community, maybe it's a business because it's also really profitable for them. What about brands and collab land? Yeah, most of the brands that you see that are involved in the crypto space are using collab land. Adidas, Puma, Lacoste, Prada, Gucci, Bud Light. They just had a NFT and they use Porsche. All the brands are. And the really cool part about brands is there's a lot of criticism in the crypto web three native circles about are they doing it right? Are they just being extractive? Mm. Are they just using us? If you think about it, Harry Styles just dropped 5,000 wallets, 5,000 NFTs along with the Magic Wallet at his concert. Are they doing it right? What they're doing is they're activating people into crypto. So I do not think of it as are they doing it right or are they doing it wrong? What they're doing is they're bringing people into crypto. And really, isn't that what we're all trying to do is for us to get more mindshare across the board. And once you have your first crypto asset, you're off to the races. This is what it is. It's very difficult to get somebody from that zero to one. And the brands are doing it for us. They're doing it right, wrong, whatever. Now these people are activated. Now they have a wallet. Now they have an asset. Now they're invested to learn more. Now when an article comes out or if somebody else talks about it, they're going to listen. 
because now they have one. So I say bring it on. Whether or not they're doing it right or wrong or you think that they're extracting from the current Web3 community, what they're doing is they're onboarding. And that's what we need. If we're going to grow this movement, which really it is a movement, if we are going to grow this movement, we need all the soldiers out there, everybody out there converting and onboarding people. And brands are doing that for us right now. Now, there are tons of other brands that are out there. I'm on the Salesforce advisory board for Web3. I get to learn a lot about the new brands that are coming on. There are so many brands that are waiting in the wing. And right now we're in the middle of a bear market. And so there's been a definite slowdown. However, there are so many people waiting now in the wings to get started. They may be looking at this as a way to make money. I get it. There's a depression or recession or whatever, financial downturn. That's happening globally. That's happening everywhere. They're looking for ways to make money too. So they may be looking at Web3 and saying, oh, that could be another profit center for us. Let them. Because what we're seeing is onboarding into crypto. So let them. If anything, it's the perfect match right now because they're doing it for one reason and we're seeing something different. Once they come in, they're going to stick around. There's a lot of criticism initially around Flow and NBA Top Shot. People would say, oh, it's their own chain. It's not interoperable. You can't sell NBA Top Shot in the open market to everybody. But a huge percentage of the people that start in NBA Top Shot move out. And they would have never made it past NBA Top Shot if they didn't first start an NBA Top Shot. You have to give people an opportunity to feel familiar and comfortable. And the big brands give them that comfort. So I say bring it on. Don't worry too much about if they're doing it right or if they're doing it wrong. They're doing it. And they may be doing it for their own reasons, but in the end, it's better for everybody. Totally agree. You asked previously whether I do NFTs and I don't much. And the reason is it, it's very arty and gamey mm. here in Japan and both spaces I'm not mm. terribly interested in. Yeah. If you had offered me NBA Top Shot or baseball cards and I'm all in. I, I still have boxes in the loft of oh, nice. uh, like baseball cards and so on. So I can fully see that. So it's just different parts of well, the, the collectible market. Yeah. Do we want to talk about collectibles? Oh That's a billion dollar market. There we go. And so now there's digital collectibles. You can pass them down. You can eat easily trade them amongst people. They can be 3D, they can be animated, they can be upgradable. If you have a baseball card and that baseball card, the person who has now new statistics, now you can update them. You can have games that you can go into a special section because they can issue you a ticket because now, oh, you're a holder and you've been a holder for this many days or this many months or this many seasons. They can drop you perks. It's a built-in with a loyalty program. There's so much that can be done. So let people start where they're going to start. Exactly. They'll get to where they need to get. Absolutely. So on the commercialization side, was Louis Vuitton or so coming out with an NFT for whatever, 45,000 US dollars? A lot but, of criticism around that. And there's certainly people for whom that is not much money. For most of us, it is. But if they tie it into special Which they do. editions That's or right. meeting certain people, people who don't have lots of money to spend might well think this is a bug. Should we judge on that? I was talking to a group of friends about like flying first class. Some people fly first class because they want the comfort. Some people fly first class for the networking. This is access. This is an opportunity in a way that maybe wasn't ever possible before. Now you have the money and your education, your social circle, the country that you live in, for whatever, physical or mental disability, whatever, for any other reason, you are not able to raise up in status. We're social creatures. To pretend that we are not social creatures is ridiculous. Humanity, that's what we've been doing from the beginning of time. From the minute that there's community, there's going to be status in community. So really, it is democratizing that in a lot of ways. A lot of money was made by people that were early especially probably the people that bought the Louis Vuitton NFT. But if you believed in it early, this was a new redistribution of wealth. And so you're really giving an opportunity to people that maybe they wouldn't have had before. And even travel, comparing it to first class flying, you still have to get to the airport. You still have to have time to get away. You still have to have the physical ability to go. With NFTs, you don't. With NFTs, you can do it from your house. 
all you need is the internet, and now most of the world has internet on their phone. If you think about that, you're giving access to people who never had access before. A lot of the complaints about Louis Vuitton was, it's so expensive, this is a bear market, the only people that can buy it are in crypto anyway, and so they're just taking money out of the crypto space. But again, they're talking about it. They're sharing it with their circles. Louis Vuitton, is, this is a conversation LVMH is now having. It's going to spark new conversations amongst fashion within their own company, but from all of their peers and all of their competitors. Still, we should look at it for the benefits that it brings to us and just the opportunities that it, it, it presents. With fashion brands too, I think about how many times do people have connection with luxury brands? How often can people afford luxury brands? Louis Vuitton took one approach, which was the high-end approach, 45,000 and up. But it would really behoove a luxury brand to have some sort of different price points for their digital tokens, because you can start that relationship with a customer as a member now at a much younger age possibly or for people build that loyalty starting early on so maybe you buy an nft at one thousand dollars when everything in that store maybe is five thousand dollars and up so there's so many different ways and having that connection instead of you having to go into the store and that's the time you have a point of connection. With NFTs, you can have constant relationship, daily relationship. That's what we do on Twitter. We say GM in the morning. Brands say GM in the morning. Say it back. And so it's, you're building this conversation with your fans who then, because now they have some ownership, they have this, they're going to be willing to talk about it more. And they, when the value of the asset goes up, they also gain from it. It's really changing the relationship from customer or audience to advocate, member, owner. And we really saw it even before crypto when you think about it. Because content creation, like social media, has allowed everybody to become a content creator. And so that was almost like a precursor to what we have now, which is ownership. Yes, you can create the content, but you're stuck on a platform. The platform itself, maybe YouTube is making money off of you. But now if you have your own asset, then you can make the money off of that. And the people that support you and believe in you can make money off of that. So it's really bringing a lot of things together that I don't think were ever possible before. My first job out of college was at an internet startup. And it was at a search engine company back in 1996, years before Google. And that was people first putting information out on the internet. Now we're 30 years later. The internet has its own money. We are on our way to becoming our own global nation state. It's very revolutionary when you sit back and think about it, how the money that we use is not limited by the government deciding what it's worth, but the holders themselves deciding what it's worth. And that's only possible because of the internet. So this is really a growing up of the internet, a maturation of the internet. Now the dark force of the government strikes back in the form of CBDCs. It'll be interesting to see, and I don't know enough about that. I know we have the Fed coin coming in the U.S. I don't know when it's coming and what that's going to look like, but I do feel like it's too many countries are now adopting it. In terms of the Western domination, I don't know if we're going to keep seeing that. Like we've had it for this long. A lot of trade is even moving away from being USD traded. The dominance of the West is beginning to decrease. And now that more countries are starting to embrace and adopt cryptocurrency, I just don't see one country being able to come around and say, or even a few handful of countries coming around to say, we're going to ban everything else and we're just going to have our own system. When I was in working at an internet company in 96 and then went through the whole dot-com bust, the internet is dead. The internet is dead is what people would say. It was a fad. The internet is a fad. But can you stop people from working together? Can you stop people from coordinating? Can you stop humans from being together? You can't. And so in the same way, this, I don't think this movement can be stopped either. Got it. But also, the focus on just NFTs sometimes is too simple. The reason I'm saying this is we had a previous podcast episode with the, with a German company called 12 by 12, which is the old vinyl format mm -hmm. they're actually doing both so they're doing a security token for music that is fully approved by the financial regulator non on a regulated platform that gives you a share of the royalties 
which is a security, which mm-hmm. is an investment and is regulated as such. And then you have the NFTs and you have a marketplace for building the fan community and yeah. being engaged, as you say, on a daily basis, because yeah. then you get limited edition of songs and so on and, and so forth. Input. And it's super, mm-hmm. super clear as to where the line is drawn. And this whole discussion that you have in the US, what is security or not, is also taken out by that. So I think that is also a smart way of really combining the traditional vote and still supporting it with new technology and then doing the new stuff all in a permissible way. That's definitely true. With Collabland, just to speak about Collabland a little bit, we have a token, but we're a Colorado digital co-op. We've used an American legal entity to form our DAO, and our DAO, our Colorado co-op, is the one that issued the token, but we have a lot of regulation around that. No pre-selling of the token, really no selling of the token at all, no providing liquidity of the token. It is a governance and a utility token to use within our ecosystem. We wanted that because because we wanted our American citizens to be able to participate. Myself and my other two co-founders are American citizens. Our communities are made up of mostly Americans, Europeans, Canadians. Really, that's the most. Then we have Asian markets and then some Africa and some South America, but overwhelmingly American. We wanted Americans to be able to participate in our token. How do you do that? The way you do that is to abide by the American legal government system. That's what we did as well. In order to legally participate, you are going to have to comply. What does that look like? You have to decide for yourself. DAO is one of my favorite subjects always because I think conceptually, although there are many nuances, people understand what a DAO is. But it always hits a brick wall in terms of liability, taxation. How does it map into the current legal entity structures that we have in the laws in different jurisdictions? But talking and, about the cooperative. Yeah, so R is a Colorado co-op. It's a Colorado digital co-op. Colorado has been supporting cooperatives for over 100 years through farming. People can have membership in the co-op, and if they participate in the co-op and do work in the co-op, then they can get patronage from the co-op. We decided to, and we're not the first, there are many DAOs that are now using the Colorado co-op structure. For us, we are in Colorado. Two of my co-founders, myself and another co-founder, are in Colorado. There's a lot of case law to support digital co-ops, and so we decided to use that one. Now, in a meta right now of pump and dumps, of airdrops, where people are making thousands and thousands of dollars, it does not fit in. I will tell you that. The typical way people launch a token is they pre-sell the token to investors for, for example, five cents. Then the day the token goes live, they sell it on the market for 10 cents, dumping on retail, typical. With a Colorado co-op, you cannot do that. That's not possible. It is a retroactive distribution to everyone who's participated in the network, and you can build the network together. So that was definitely trying to share that message and explain that in the current market where we live right now. This time in crypto is highly speculative, and people are looking at it as just I want to get rich and give me tokens. And with those tokens, I'm going to sell them for $20,000 today, and then I'm never going to see you again. Trying to say to them, here, join our DAO. This is a membership for you because you use our social product. You are a member of our product. Do you want to help guide where this product goes, how we move forward? Do you want to participate in the future of our product instead of being a passive consumer, right? Like Facebook isn't asking you what you want to do next. But with our opportunity with Collabland, you can vote on what happens next with Collabland. Do you want that? Initially, I wanted to call it airdropping responsibility. My co-founders were like, nobody's going to like that. But that's really what we're doing. And that's really what we were doing. And that, yes, we're limited by Colorado Co-op because we are also security exempt within a certain structure. We have to behave a certain way in order to remain security exempt. Now, if we behave in a way that other uh, DAOs are behaving, then of course we're going to get into trouble and nobody wants to do that. So for our purposes, it was perfect, which is we want to include the over 2 million people who have interacted with Collabland to be able to have a voice in what happens to Collabland in the future. So that's where we are today. We have about uh, 50,000 people who have joined our DAO. Yeah, so it's pretty exciting and we will continue to grow together. That's the whole idea, which is 
instead of just being a passive consumer, be a participant. That's what this is about. This is about ownership. This is about taking control of what you do and who you are and where you interact. Don't just be on the internet and be clicking everywhere randomly and going from place to place. That's time you're spending minutes of your life. Just like you and I are talking right now and we're having minutes of our life, what you're doing spending time on a website, that's minutes of your life. It does not go away. We both know we're halfway through our lives. How much more time do we have? Do we want to just be passively consuming or are we taking ownership and determining how we want, where we go and what we do and being able to have a voice in that? So that's really the purpose of our Colorado co-op. And so it was a perfect fit for us. The team is all on a four-year lockup. The investors are all on a four-year lockup. This is not about any kind of making money off of people. It's about working together and growing together. If we win, everybody wins. And let's all win together. I love the cooperative concept generally. Insurance companies used to be co-ops. The profit motive has completely overtaken that, whatever. In the 50s, 60s, they all turned into publicly listed companies and along the way the spirit of that community what cooperative really stands for got lost you don't have a spokesperson like maybe wyoming has i don't think colorado gets so much credit or the credit that's due for actually we're getting out there enabling that concept we're getting out there i talk about it as often as i can there are a few others east denver is also the largest East Conference, 25,000 people. I don't know if you were in attendance, but they are also a Colorado co-op. And so there are, REI is a Colorado co-op. It's a famous uh, sporting goods store. They're not in crypto, but they're also a Colorado co-op. They don't have a spokesperson. Maybe that is the problem. Maybe I need to be the spokesperson for Colorado co-op. If you can build your DAO elsewhere and not have these legal restrictions, people are moving out of the U.S., Let's just call it for what it is. And so there isn't as much interest. Right now, people are looking at different countries, Cayman Islands or Luxembourg. or There's lots of different places that people are going in order to build their DAO structure and launch a token. But moving forward, let's see. It's unknown, but let's see. I'm hopeful because there is a path forward for Americans. And we're in the middle of a bear market, so maybe people are just gathering information right now. But let's see. I'm hopeful. We're very lucky to be in Colorado. Our governor, Jared Polis, is extremely pro-crypto and wants to find a way to work. They take crypto for tax payments. They are also building up their own crypto treasury. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear in terms of sequence of events, you've always been in Colorado and you got lucky that the regulations or you moved the entity to Colorado and yourself to... Our company, our corporation is abridged. We're Delaware Corporation. But when we spun off Collabland as its own entity, Mm -hmm. we were already living in Colorado. We moved to Colorado for a completely unrelated reason for my daughter. And we found a school in Colorado that was a good fit for her. Mm. We used to live in California. So we moved for a different reason to Colorado. But when it came time for Collabland to be its own legal entity, we were in Colorado. And really, truly, since being in Colorado all these years, we've made a lot of good contacts being there. It's a very pro-crypto space. And we grew with it. We're just lucky to be where we are. It was great to see you in person, a joy to experience all the energy and positivity. And I think we've generated just a ton of fabulous content as well. So I really appreciated the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a joy. Thank you.